Hello everyone and welcome to this review of Archetype Arcadia. Love a bit of alliteration. Now it is worth pointing out that this game is currently available on the Switch, PS4, PS5 and is coming to the Windows in very very soon. In fact it's probably already out by the time this video goes out. I'm running a little bit behind. But it is worth pointing out that it is currently only Japanese. Yes, there is no official localization, not even announced. So uh, we don't know if this is going to be in English or not, but we thought it would be nice to bring it to your attention and you can badger Kemco, the publisher in Japan, to, you know, make it happen if you like it. Big thanks to Miguel Marin for writing this review. He can read Japanese, I can't, so these are definitely his words, not mine. Please follow him on Twitter with the link in the description. Lately it seems like Kemco has garnered a bit of popularity within the visual novel community, mainly thanks to Raging Loot's moderate success here in the West. They have, however, released quite a few other VNs besides that one, with today's VN being one of them. Even if they share the same publisher, Archetype Arcadia does not in fact share the same scenario writer as Raging Loop. This time, the author, as well as artist behind the game, goes by the name of R. Their previous work, Sasasagu, received quite favourable reception among those who played the fairly obscure VN. After seeing so many positive reviews, I got intrigued by it and decided to give this next work of theirs a shot. And here are my thoughts. The game begins with our two protagonists, Rusto and his little sister Christine, roaming a seemingly desolate post-apocalyptic earth with their trailer house. In this earth, an illness called Picatomania has spread around the globe, almost completely eradicating the entirety of humanity. Those who fall victim to it are constantly tormented by nightmares and hallucinations and end up completely losing their sanity, often leading to their own suicides. The only treatment to it is by logging into a VR online game called Archetype Arcadia. And even then, it's by no means the cure to it, but simply a means to slow down its symptoms. Christine is one of those afflicted by this illness, although she was seemingly doing alright. That is until one day when Rusto finds her unconscious with her login device disconnected to her side. He then tries to log her back in, but after realizing its futility, he decides to connect himself to the game and find help within Archetype Arcadia. After entering this virtual world, he immediately reunites with his sister Christine, who has lost the ability to properly speak, and doesn't seem to recognize Rusto as her brother. But that brief moment of joy is short-lived, as he quickly finds that Archetype Arcadia is no playground. This is a place where people fight each other using avatars that are created out of the so-called memory cards, which are a weaponized representation of the user's memories. You can think of them as something like personalized Pokemon. However, if one of those cards gets destroyed, the user loses all the memories associated to that card, lose them all, and it's game over. What this entails is that in the real world, the user's Picatomania condition immediately worsens into its final stage, driving them into complete insanity, effectively finishing them. It's certainly an intriguing take on the Isekai formula, and right from the start of the game, it wastes no time at all explaining how its systems work. It kind of feels like it's just running you through its tutorial. And I have to say, it's one comprehensive tutorial. The setting feels thoroughly thought out with no apparent plot holes whatsoever. But I believe this video gaming setting works as a double-edged sword in some regards. On one hand, it offers a complex and intricate world that's immediately understandable to anyone who's played a JRPG in their life, which allows the story to focus on its themes rather than having to constantly explain what's going on or how things work. Excluding, of course, the previously mentioned tutorial introduction. On the other hand, however, having such a strong parallelisms with different video game genre creates a certain expectation that are not always met, nor do they blend well with how this visual novel narrative works. I'm basically talking about the character's main objectives and how they are carried out. With JRPGs, you will usually have one main objective, as in defeat the big baddie or save the world. So everything you do is in a way directly related to that goal. There's always that tangible feeling of progression, in part thanks to your characters leveling up. So for every boss you defeat, every dungeon you clear, you feel that slightly closer to the ending. In this game, however, there is a certain moment in the plot when the goal suddenly becomes a lot more vague, making it quite hard to calculate how far into the story you actually are. On top of that, it often feels like the plot is moving sideways for long periods of time, almost like the story got completely sidetracked and you were forced to clear some irrelevant side missions. Admittedly, everything does play its role within the plot, so I can't call it pure filler, but considering the length of this VN as a whole, it gives the feeling of stagnation. 
Another thing that I found unique, for better or worse, is how this game deals with its foreshadowing. It's so plainly obvious when the game is presenting it. Just to give an example, as previously said, inside Archetype Arcadia, people fight using representations of their memories, so-called avatars. So you just know that later on there's going to be a flashback sequence explaining why each character has the avatars they do. But surprisingly, for as transparent as that foreshadowing is, it can still catch you off guard, mainly because it's so constant and overwhelming that it's hard to keep track of it all. So when, let's say, 15 hours after some random tidbit was mentioned gets suddenly brought up again, it's still somewhat fresh because by the time you get there, you've almost likely forgotten about it already. As for the characters, I think they are the game's strongest point. They are all extremely unique with complex and interesting conflicts. This is also where I feel the setting itself shines the brightest. Having such a strong relation between their backstories and how the characters themselves are represented within the video game world is a pretty clear way to hint at the true selves without relying on old personality tropes. There is, however, one character that just never clicked with me, and unfortunately, that character is the main protagonist himself. He is overly naive and optimistic, which clashes with the overall hopelessness of the narrative. I understand that this is intentional, and I'm not saying that this juxtaposition is inherently bad, but there were quite a few moments where it feels like he's trying really hard to change the mood of a scene, and it often feels too forced. I get the feeling that this has to do with how some of the lines were delivered. I don't believe the voice actor himself was miscast since during some of the more emotional scenes, he truly sells them. It's just that maybe he should have toned down the goody two-shoes tone he often used for his deliveries. Speaking of which, the voice work in general was above what I was expecting for a slightly budgeted VN like this. I tried to look them up on VNDB and it seems like most of the actors aren't really that well known with very few roles overall, which did surprise me. There were some side characters that felt a bit off, but those were nothing more than that, side characters. And while we're talking about audio, let's mention the music, which is also quite good, with a lot of variety. However, that variety made some tracks stand out more than they probably should have, especially during the action scenes, which by the end of the game led to some repetition concerning how many fights there were. I would have liked a few more tracks with similar instrumentation or some sort of remixed versions of already existing tracks to alleviate that repetition, but still, what's here is enjoyable indeed. So to conclude, is Archetype Arcadia worth the 40 or 50 hours it takes to finish? Maybe, kinda. I know this is ambiguous as an answer, it's not what you were hoping for after clicking this video, but that's really the best I can give you here. For me, it's really hard to find a similar VN regarding its themes and narrative structure, so I can't just say if you like this or that VN, you might like this one. Maybe the author's previous work could be a good point of reference, but at the time of writing this review, I haven't played any of them. This uniqueness, however, is indeed one of Archetype Arcadia's strongest points, and it is commendable on its own. I will also say that its more emotional scenes can hit quite hard, so when the game peaks in quality, it truly peaks. But that is when it peaks, because for the most part, it's just a fairly bland affair. Overall, I don't particularly regret my time with it, and I don't want to dissuade anyone from giving the game a shot, just keep in mind that it might be a bit of a bumpy road ahead. A 6.5 out of 10. Alright guys, would you be willing to give this a go if it was translated into English? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks to Miguel Marin for writing this review. You know, he speaks Japanese, so uh, he's very good with stuff like this. And yeah, be sure to check out some of his other reviews. We have a Clockwork Leyline trilogy review from him. Plus, we've got some other stuff that is on the screen right now. If you've not subscribed already, please do so. Click that bell button and spread the word of VM Paradise. It would help us out massively. So, please check out some of our other stuff. As I've said, we'll see you over there. Have a good one.